Hello, my name is Dr. Max Libaron, and I'm about to uh, convene a workshop for brand or er, new assistant professors who have just completed their first year at Memorial University. And we're going to be working on what's called the first year review here, which is the first time professors uh, hand in a document about what they've been doing to the promotion and tenure committee. This is not the moment of promotion and tenure. It's a check in, but it becomes the document that your promotion and tenure documents get based on. And so we'll be talking a lot about promotion and tenure merit here at Memorial University. The collective agreement is going to come up a lot in this workshop because Memorial University has an excellent collective agreement. It does things like recognize Indigenous traditional knowledge and local knowledge uh, as deserving of merit in research uh, uh, adjudication, for instance. But if you're at an institution that doesn't have an amazing collective agreement, the idea of, of, a, of a guiding document to mold your first year review and your eventual, eventual promotion and tenure file around stands. And the way you find that document is if your promotion or tenure is, if you have to contest the decision around your promotion or tenure, like if they deny it to you and you have to fight it, where do you go and what documents guide that? And you find that out and those are the documents you write around. Every institution must have them, uh, even if they're not great documents. So there will be a guiding document and you always write towards that document. There are many reasons for that, but this workshop is geared towards the folks who are at risk for not being understood by promotion and tenure committees because of numerous problems in dominant research paradigms. So this includes Black, Indigenous, and scholars of color. This includes people who do EDI research that is often mistaken for service. This is for people who do community-based research where people don't understand the time and the skills that takes and how it's different than other forms of research out of the discipline. This is for folks who are radically interdisciplinary, so they will automatically be illegible to some parts of the committee. And so that's why you write towards those documents. You should do it anyway, but th these are, this workshop is for the riskier cases. If you're not a riskier case, you still do the same things and you're golden. Nicely done. All right, so uh, the next thing you will see is the actual workshop. It is not polished, it is casual, it is come as you are and any parts they were recorded will be recorded with permission. All right, so thank you for joining. What we're gonna do is start with some sort of logistics about what a first year review and sort of a promotion and tenure file is and how it works here. Then I'll do an overview of each piece, the cover letter, the research dossier, the teaching dossier and the service dossier. We'll, we'll do Q and A, some questions and answers, and then we're gonna actually workshop your cases. Uh, that's what we'll do for the majority of the time. So there are a few like, like actual rules and that's really nice. So first of all, the first year review is a non-decision year for folks. So at Memorial, you put something in uh, at the end of your first year, which people call your second, what the collective agreement calls your second year, which is very confusing. Just like after your fifth year, you go up for promotion and tenure, which the collective agreement will call your sixth year, which is very confusing. <laughs> um, but the collective agreement is like the law, the gospel, the spell book, whatever you're like the most guiding of documents are. And so the first thing you do is read it. Read the section about promotion and tenure. It includes a little note about first year review. What happens with first year review is you put in like a, uh, a you know, the, as close to a promotion and tenure file as you have, which is expected to be thin. The promotion and tenure uh, committee reviews it and writes a letter that goes into your file that the head um, receives, and that's it. Same thing happens in your second year. Your third year, after your third year, um, it's a non-decision review where, like, the letter goes to the a, a letter is written by the department head, which also goes to the dean. The dean writes the letter. It's a non-decision year, but it's it's an important part of your file. The decision happens at promotion and tenure. So this, so the document that you do in your first year is basically like a template that you develop each year until you've got promotion and tenure, and then after that full. So, so you have lots of wiggle room to get things wrong for a couple of years, um, but you want to have a good start. So the first thing you do is read the collective agreement because not only does it does it govern how people are evaluated, but if anything goes sideways, your only recourse is the collective agreement. Now, especially folks who do community-based work or 
really innovative, hard to understand work or work where things people might think it's service instead of research. Or if you just happen to not be a white dude, um, there's going to, there, that's it's it becomes more risky, although in Canada, it's not a super high risk um, that you don't get tenure or promotion. Um, but the collective agreement is what adjudicates that. And in cases that I know about, mostly where transphobia was probably in, in a problem, uh, the collective agreement is what gets it out of the hot water. Uh, it's not a fun process, but it's a process and you can write to it. Also, it's how like the committee just like adjudicates and can say yes or no. So that means you organize your dossier according to the terms and sections of the collective agreement. And I'll show you what that looks like. And you use the words that it uses. So when it says international reputation, even if you think that's a dirty word, you say international reputation. Even if you then want to like define that for the committee or something like that. Especially for folks here, I'm going to assume like, so Daria, I, I, I read about your work in HSS and uh, and uh, Michelle, or I know a bit about your work and Erica, I know your work really well. Community-based work isn't always legible and sometimes people pop it into service and you will probably pop it into service because of like dominant research paradigms, it's almost certainly research, right? So like working with language holders, working, that's that's research, that's not service. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's a thing to remember. And then last, talk to colleagues. If you, if you have good relationships in your department, or even if you don't, ask people for their uh, first year review documents uh, or their promotion and tenure files. And if you don't have someone in your department, you can talk to me about it and have them look at it. I did a, I was on a promotion and tenure committee file, promotion and tenure committee, where we looked at a first year review and the person just wasn't fully aware of what does and doesn't go in a CV. Totally normal. It was their first year, of course, but if they had just shown it to somebody that could have been corrected and the committee could have spent its time doing something else. Um, just show it to someone. Again, if you don't have someone, you can show it to me. Um, but someone in your department is best because they will be most fluent in what your your discipline looks like. All right, so that is that. So the whether it's promotion and tenure to, to associate or full or your first year review or your third year non-decision review, you start with a cover letter. Your cover letter is a story. You can compile all the documents you want, but none of them speak for themselves. Like CVs don't speak for themselves. So this is you crafting a story about who you are as a professor or researcher, et cetera, and what's going on. And, and this is the only place that truly happens, uh, especially as it's the only place that isn't segmented into these three chunks of our collective agreement, research, teaching, and service. So if you have connections between those three things, which you absolutely will, uh, this is the place to tell those stories. You should have many descriptive, short, clear, definitive statements. I am a feminist urban geographer specializing in the reclamation of uh, women's spaces uh, in basements, right? Because your p and committee is going to cut and paste that and put it into their letters of recommendation. Guaranteed. I've never been on a committee that didn't do quite a bit of cutting and pasting and then dressing up around them. And so make their lives easy by telling them like what you are and what you're doing. So again, this is uh, talking about the ties between research, teaching, and service. So I usually have a throwaway line like, even though research, teaching, and service are seen as three separate categories, mine are all connected by short, pithy, declarative, copy, and save. An ethics of, uh, of for mine might be an ethic of um, collaboration between peoples and lands. I don't know, something like that, but, but narrate that for them. Talk about your trajectory in retrospect, like you planned it, which will never ever be the case, but you have to make your trajectory legible. So for something like your first year review, that's just the trajectory of what you, maybe what you were doing before and what you're doing now that you're assistant professor here. It could be a, a, a trajectory about now that you're an assistant professor, you could do all these things that you were starting before, but now you have the resources to do. It could be about place-basedness if, if, if you've moved here and re-anchored re your work here. It can be how your connections back to where you're reaching before have developed or changed, whatever. Um, I have a non-traditional trajectory. I have degrees that are not even remotely related to what I do now. I was an administrator for a year. I changed two years. I changed departments. 
I do a lot of work on this one and make it sound like strengths. <laughs> like going to administration was a way to capitalize on this stuff and do it in a new place in a way I couldn't go to as a researcher. But then I came back because, right, like for a new reason that isn't, you know, so, so this is part of the storytelling, your trajectory. Highlight what is most important about the period being covered in your dossier. So for first year review, that's the first year. The collective agreement makes it clear that you can talk about what you've done before you've come to Memorial, but really the, dis the meat is since you've been here. For your third year non-decision, that's three years. For your P&T, that's four or five years, depending if you're going up early. For full, it's the year between your associate and your full, right? So whatever that time is, you highlight it. So like a sentence like, the three most important things I've done in this time period are, and here is why. That is exactly what goes in a cover letter because you can't do it the same way in your dossiers. Um, and then uh, we, I, I was on a P&T committee once where the person had such a well-organized application, like submission. People talked about it constantly on the committee and we could make a decision for that person better, faster, and clearer than we could for the rest of the pool, be be literally just because of the organization. Subheadings, chunks, clear statements. So organize the crap out of things. So because the committee, like it's huge documents. Some committee m members don't even read everything. Um, so you organizing things make things skimmable for parts of the committee and grabbable for the chair who writes your, your letter. Um, yeah. So, and have someone look at your cover letter. I always have to, if, even if you don't do the rest of the dossier, definitely your cover letter. All right, so the most important part, so you've got your cover letter and then you have three like three chapters, essentially. One is research, one is teaching, which includes mentorship, and one is service. Uh, our collective agreement says it's a, what is it? 30, 30, 20, no, that doesn't add up. 40, 40, 20? Anyway, research and teaching are supposed to be equal to the smaller chunk of uh, service and the percentages are in the collective agreement. So the research and teaching dossiers are the most important. And when I get to the service one, I'm gonna tell you to leave it last because it won't make or break your case. You just have to do service. You don't even have to do it well, according to the words in the collective agreement. So the research dossier, here's, here's the table of contents for my promotion and tenure. So not my first year review. So this will not look the same for you and it can't look the same for you. Um, but for like privacy and stuff, I've consented to using mine. So um, my my research statement sort of introduces people to like the disciplinary the disciplines that I'm working at. I'm extremely interdisciplinary, and so I just describe to people what I'm doing in each field and how they're related, because the committee won't know. Uh, so like community oriented might be one that you two you all are involved in too. And then my markers of scholarly achievement, this list is literally just out of the collective agreement, the headings. And I've got literally the, the article number in the collective agreement that it refers to. Um, I'm gonna hit a few highlights, but everyone's will look a little bit different. But um, this again is geared for folks who aren't necessarily doing like 98 peer reviewed publications, but are also doing community work and, and creative work and this sort of stuff that might be less, less legible. So our job is to make it legible. So one of the things, one of the cases I always have to make is interdisciplinarity and explain that I just don't mean like two types of geography. I mean like being interdisciplinary. And so one of the things I do, um, and again, this is research, not teaching, is I do a survey of who teaches my work. And I do this in a number of ways. I do it through Twitter. Uh, I do it through emails with colleagues. I do it through Google searches. I do it through open syllabus. And I'll show you some of those tools. But I say like which disciplines people are teaching my, my research, right? This And this is an impact statement. I am making impacts with my research in educational settings in the following disciplines. And this is how I articulate my kind of interdisciplinarity as well as a type of impact. Um, I'm gonna show you a few other tools, but before I do that, any questions? Thoughts? Emphasize? Hi, Max. I think I have lots of questions, but I don't know if it's better to leave it till the end or because they're kind of like specific 
to like yeah your case yeah all right so i'm going to talk about some of the tools you can make to do the show it don't say it so you can say i'm an impactful researcher all you want but if the committee is not prone to believe you that's not enough so because i'm a non-traditional researcher i have a ton of tricks for this all right so i'm going to share my screen you are going to see my googles no my internets starting with my Googles. So um, using something like an H index is a little bit sketchy, mostly because your H index must start low when you are starting and it will grow over time. So using it, especially towards your assistant is not useful. The way I found it useful is comparing my H index to my first year, to my fifth year, and my associate professor H index to my full professor application index because it grows. And so I'm competing against myself. However, Google Scholar, and again, this is someone who's about to go up for full. So please do not use this as a benchmark for your first year review. That would be very unkind to yourself. But a couple of things. I find that Google Scholar collects my pieces better than other things that measure H index like Scopus or something like that, mostly because I do a lot of gray literature like reports. Um, secondly, it sort of shows this nice graph over time. So you could copy and paste it. Um, and you can go see whose site, like if you click on this, it'll go see who's citing your work and you might use that as part of your argument. So like if people, if a lot of say indigenous folks are using your stuff or a lot of uh, indigenous governments end up citing your stuff, you might wanna talk about who's citing and why that matters to your impact. So you, would, this is my book, so it's, so, the Nutmegs Curse, which has won seven awards, four awards, has cited my book in passing, <laughs> like very much in passing. So it would be a bit of an oversell. But I could say like, look, this fancy dude who isn't even an academic is citing my work. I don't know, uh, for instance. The other thing I want to point out, I'm going to go, I've organized this according to the number of citations. If you go to the bottom of my list, oh, something horrible has happened to the formatting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. The pieces of mine that are least cited are absolutely book chapters. My book chapters do not get read. They are sometimes on the same sort of things and are often published earlier than things I write articles about and they just don't land. And so as a result, um, I tend not to do book chapters anymore unless there's a really, really, really good reason that has nothing to do with my career merits. Um, so FYI, um, some of this is early, but like, um, listen, I'm trying to find a specific piece. I can't find it. One of the first pieces I ever did that was, a uh, in 10 years ago in 2013 was, um, uh, was really a precursor to my book, which has done very well, but no one's read it. So FYI, the other thing is if you're using your H index, so see, I have like, um, I, these two things are identical. I need to go into my Google Scholar and clean this up because it's H index is based on the number of things you publish versus how many times they're cited. And so this is counting as two things, which will bring down my H index. And so I just need to tell, I just need to tell Google what the deal is uh, for that kind of thing. So this is one uh, one sort of way you can do your impact or metrics. Another one is just going to articles that you want to argue are really important. So here's one, and this one for me is not peer reviewed. This was an invited article that was editor reviewed, which is not peer reviewed. And the collective agreement says, therefore it's not counted as much, but I'm trying to argue it's super important. So number one, I can say it is invited by some person at nature people are impressed by nature automatically. But number two, if you're invited, it means you have a reputation and the word reputation is in the collective agreement. But there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, I have a S-Site um, plugin and you can just click that and it'll give you like some of the impacts. This has been cited in 31 applications uh, and references, whatever that means, 31 reference statements. Here are the, here are the folks who are doing it. Uh, and my, I am, I do have an account, but I'm not signed into it, so it can't tell me everything. But it can, it can say, um, it can tell you. So I'm a methodologist, so some of my papers get mentioned exclusively in method sections. So I can make an impact, uh, a statement that I'm making impact in methodologies in certain fields. 
um, that I'm helping with analytical work, that I'm helping with problem introduction or in problem definition if it's in introductions. There's also, I also have a plugin called Altimetric. It's just a plugin you can download. And it gives you the these things, the wheelies. So two news outlets have talked about this. Over a thousand people have tweeted it. It's on Reddit. By the way, most of this stuff is probably super racist because of what this is about. And it might not be positive. Doesn't matter for my PNT file. People are talking about it. I can claim international influence because most folks who are doing this are coming from the United States, but I can also name these other places. Nigeria, right? I, you can cut, copy and paste this as a screenshot right into your into your PNT file. Um, and if you don't have the plugin, you can go to Altimetric itself and um, input your stuff directly into this website. Altimetric is good because it, it basically uh, tracks impact, like how something moves around once you've published it. Uh, it usually just does peer-reviewed pieces. It sometimes does blog posts, but mostly peer-reviewed pieces. For teaching, you can use this awesome thing called Open Syllabus. It collects syllab like gazillions. This is how many gazillion is uh, syllabi. You can look for yourself in it. This might be maybe for your third year review, but uh, eight of my pieces are in fifty three syllabi. Let me see, can I zoom? Yeah, so I can see which pieces those are. Um, I can see how often they're used. Uh, I think you can go you can go into the syllabi and actually look like which disciplines and stuff are using. So I use this to talk about interdisciplinarity. Um, and the other statement I can make is that what's being taught is rarely what's being cited. So I have th there are three syllabi who use this piece that's like almost never cited. <laughs> um, for instance. So same with this one. This is another book chapter that's never cited, but it's used in the syllabus. So I can, I, you know, I can, I can get some of my merit this way. It's important not because of citation, but because of teaching and its use in pedagogy. Um, and then the last thing is, depending on whether you have access to blog sort of stuff, I have a, a website for my lab for myself, and I used to run a publication that had one. And so using the stats for these are really important. You can talk about views over time. You can talk about what people, so like our lab book, which is not published, uh, has been viewed almost 2000 times in the last years. And you can, again, a nice breakdown of where your research matters, Kansas, English speaking places. You can copy and paste this. And then you can talk about, say which for all time, which are your most important posts or pages or pieces or blog posts or resources or something like this. This is, there we go. Oh, there we go. A cheeky blog post <laughs> about how people don't really decolonize their syllabi, <laughs> how that's not really possible. Um, it's a short, pithy, it used to be a, a Twitter thread. This is my most popular thing. So I can like, it's not cited ever, but I can say, look, it's got nearly 40,000 views, which is more than any paper um, I've ever done is. So there's just a few different methods for talking about impact. Um, in the case of like talking about how things that are your service are actually research. So if you do things because of your expertise, if community people call you because of your expertise, if you're asked to intervene into things because of your expertise, if you sit on boards because of your expertise, if you, if you, um, do community presentations because of your expertise, that's research. That was the number one thing. So the person who told me to do that is Norm Cato, who is my old chair. Norm Cato is not a radical guy, right? And he was like, oh yeah, that's research. That's research. You, you. So in my first year review, I called it service or it's my third year non-decision review. I called it service. And he was like, no, that all needs to get moved into research because it's about your expertise that can, anyone can sit on a P&T committee. Not everyone can do the certain things because of your expertise. So think of it that way. Do they need you specifically? It's because of your expertise, it's research. Questions? All right, teaching. So teaching counts for approximately the same amount at this stage. Once you go for full, you go up for teaching or research, not both. But until then, until you've already gotten your associate professorness, teaching and research is supposed to be equal. 
culturally, research is more important, so it's still biased that way, but on paper. So here's my uh, table of contents. I still have a teaching philosophy. You'll see it is less than one page. Our collective agreement, the teaching thing is super short, but it says there's an appendix for the CAUT, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, that talks about all the ways you can show your effectiveness as a teacher, and you can draw from that. There is one very special thing about our university, which is that you do not have, there are rules around using course reviews, student written course reviews, the, what are they called, CEQs, course evaluation questionnaires. The union has won the argument that those things are super sexist and racist. Because of that, we do not have to use them. If you choose not to use them, you have to put in a statement that says you are not using them because of this ruling. The language for that is in my file, mine was. I used to teach engineers, but I do not include my CEQs and everything. Those people were not nice. Um, but then you can't use any of them. If you do choose to use them, you must use 100% of them from the last three years. You've only been here for a year, so it'll be a year. But for the last three years, as you go through, you must use them at all 100% the last three years. If you use them, if you don't, zero. There's no in-betweeny weenie. So FYI. Um, However, if you eat CEQs, course evaluation questionnaires, are the easiest ways to argue for your teaching effectiveness, even though they're biased. So if you don't use them, you have to think of some other things to put instead. Um, one of the things you include in this is like literally what you've taught and how many people were in those courses and whether they were preps or not. You will all have had new preps because you're new. So you should talk about how many new preps you had, which is more work and more teacherly labor. Um, I do so graduate and undergraduate are divided in the collective agreement. So divide that. Um, I have like my teaching style in this stuff and I have like a uh, classroom community accountability. So I do certain assignments for that. I include an example of an assignment, um, hands-on experiential learning, fancy words. This is again, like when I did the disciplines, let me tell you what I'm like in the research statement. This is like, let me tell you what I'm like, like as a teacher. Your mentorship is involved here. Graduate uh, graduate supervision and outside of graduate supervision. The vast majority, like I do massive, I, I run a lab and the lab is both an incubator for research, but there's a ton of mentorship that goes with it. So I have a huge mentorship section because I do so much work in mentorship in my lab. But I also, and you all, and especially I think Erica, I also have a special section on when I teach my peers because of the ignorance in the university around indigenous issues and how much teaching I have to do. And so like, I sometimes get asked to do workshops for my peers about how to do research ethics. That goes here, that's teaching, that's not service, that's teaching. I'm teaching them a skill they should already know. <laughs> um, and then when I was an administrator, I had to do a lot of teaching people 101, like racism 101, and I included that in here. And the reason I could is that I had someone from CITL uh, the Center for Integrative Learning and Technology, or Innovative, I don't know what the I is, something good, come into one of those sessions and do a classroom evaluation of me. And it's the same format. Did I come in early? How did I prepare? How did I talk to the to the peers that I was teaching? How did I, and he wrote up an evaluation and I included that evaluation here. And part of the reason I did this is I went up for full after not teaching for two years because I was a I was an administrator and you don't teach. And so I had to make the case that actually, yes, I'm still teaching, just not in a classroom. And here's proof. I have a teaching evaluation. So CEQs are the most obvious. So I'm going to talk about a few, and classroom is a little bit easier. So I'm going to talk a bit about mentorship, mostly because that's what my teaching dossier is full of. So there's a lot of, mentorship is usually invisible. So one of the ways I make it visible is showing how many and what kind of people are in my lab. So 30 people in the lab in a year, it's freaking huge. And I have high school students and junior faculty in my lab. And that is unrecognizable by the university. Those people will never end up in a classroom. So this is how they end up in my, in my dossier, how I represent them. Um, yeah, I talk about peer numbers, mostly because people on the committee can think about how many people are in their labs. And mine will always have more just because of the model of my lab. So every time I think I know I'm going to excel at something, I definitely point it out and bold it and quantify it. Because those are things I get copied and pasted into my thing. Just because I have 24 people in the lab in a year doesn't mean I'm a good mentor, actually. I might be a horrible mentor with a horrible factory 
situation for the students. But this is still for some reason understood as merit. And so I will bold it and quantify it for them. While also providing evidence that also I'm not a jerk to those 24 people, including letters from my students where I outline the conditions under which that was asked for, for ethics. And again, to make the case that not only am I, one of the skills I have as a mentor is teaching and mentoring people from vastly different disciplines, which means I need fluency across disciplines. And so here, I'll, this is another discipline argument I'm making. Look at the cascade. It's not just two types of geography or like two types of science. It is like social work and biology and sociology in the same, and French in the same lab. And let me tell you how I mentor that as a skill, as merit, as a good job, right? And so that's what this sort of thing is for. Just, just trying to show different ways. Um, what you should absolutely all do is invite either a, a peer who is senior to you that you trust, or someone from CITL to come in and do a classroom observation of you, either on like whether even if you teach online, uh, that's you can put that in your dossier and also quote from it. Um, if you do in class evaluation, so like every every year at midterms, I do a how is it going, what's working, what's not working class survey, and then I change what I'm doing based on that. CAUT dossier says, if you change something due to feedback, that's a sign of good teaching. And so I articulate that. Um, I, have an, I have an assignment called before and after in a bunch of my classes where people answer a basic question before we've done the class, like on the first day. And then they answer the same question on the last day of class and talk about how they've changed their mind, like show how they're teaching, how they've learned. And I include that assignment uh, in a lot of my reviews to, sh to show, like it shows my students learn. And they're just two paragraphs, they're super short, but you can build, you probably have things in your course where you, that you use to evaluate your student teaching and have them give you feedback. You can include those in your PNT file. They're better than CEQ. CEQs are usually popularity contests. And if you have things built in your class, almost guaranteed it's not a popularity contest because why would you have that in your class? Um, yeah, so that's why this says start documenting now. Um, uh, yeah, most people include like a syllabus for one of their preps in their first year review and often in their third year and maybe even their first PNT, just to be like, this is a class prep. This is what I did. Some people annotate it with like uh, comments, like a Microsoft comments. This is in this order, because as we know, the debate in the field is this, or like my approach to teaching means we do ethics first, not last. Therefore, this section goes first, but this is, which you can see in my teaching philosophy, you know, like whatever. This section teaches them the three, three academic skills as well as content. The skills are this, this, and this, which maybe you can't see. It likes, so you can annotate your syllabus to show people things. There's, there's lots of tricks where you're gonna have to strategize how to show teaching effectiveness instead of stating teaching effectiveness. All right, service. So I highly recommend treating service as an afterthought because you, it will not make or break your case. Also, especially for first year review, you should have been protected from service by your department. I know that often doesn't happen, but um, there are concrete reasons to have less service, including in the collective agreement you do less. Uh, but also if you're BIPOC, do community-based research, et cetera, you, service will find you. So that's why I say, uh, leave it till last. But secondly, also make it a narrative. So my, um, uh, I do a, a lot of service, although not as much as Erica, and I hope I never do. Um, but so I break down university faculty and departmental committees, mostly because the collective agreement does. And then, so basically it's just the breakdown of that is in the collective agreement. Uh, service to uh, professional organizations and associations, um, general administrative duties. I maintained the departmental website for a while. Um, community service, um, where the individual has made a contribution by virtue of special academic competence. So that's expertise again, but um, most of this stuff is up in my research part. Not, it's mentioned again, but usually in a little list. I say leave it last because whenever I go up for a dis, so whenever I put one of these dossiers together, it is full time for a week. And every year, like I mean real, full, like eight hours a day for five days. And I've been tracking this stuff all year. So my CV is already always up to date. I tend to grab these little graphy things and stuff as I go along. 
And it still takes me eight hours a day for five days to put my dossier together every year. And every year I get burned by underestimating the time, which is why I'm saying leave this last. If you have to skimp on something or do a bad job, do it in the ser service dossier. At the same time, keep telling your story in the service dossier if you have enough time to do it. So one of the stories I tell about professional development is like, uh, this is a graph of, um, so see my first year, this was my, I started, I was on almost nothing. This is my first year review. I was only on four things, only on four committees, which is actually a bit much. Um, but now I'm on a zillion committees and I've color coded them to be like, look, I started in the department, but see how, and the, and the faculty has waned and me doing uh, committee work for the university and outside the university has increased as I become better and better known. And as my skill set for interdisciplinary work becomes more and more valuable, I, that means that the department has itself covered with anyone in the department, but I, I am special because I can only do some of this interdisciplinary stuff. Especially, I sit on a lot of awards committees at the university because of my interdisciplinary. So I, I can describe this as a maturation of my service. You can also do this with moving from inside the university to outside the university or um, right, these other sort of things that, that uh, queue up to, to development or growth sort of narratives when it comes to service. Um, uh, from member to chair, uh, from administrator to director, right, that kind of stuff. Also, if there's anything weird, you should narrate it. So for instance, when I was a full-time administrator, I wasn't allowed to sit on departmental committees with a conflict of interest. And so like, I just narrate, the reason this isn't here is this. It's not because I stopped doing service. It's because there's a rule against me not doing that service, right? So just narrate that stuff for folks. Um, you can do the work to tie your service back into your other sections. So like, because I take teaching so seriously, a lot of my service is around curriculum um, and around indigenization um, and around my areas of expertise. So, you know, that takes what's above and plumps it into the service and connects it back again. That's why dividing the three is not so great, whatever. You can do that kind of work as well. Um, but if we look at the length of my service dossier, 40 pages to 49 pages, nine pages, let's compare that to my research dossier, which, oh, this is just the first part, 19 pages before the appendix, 12 pages before the to get to the appendix, right? So it's a fraction that my service dossier is a fraction of my other, my other pieces. And again, you wanna do the work to get as much out of your service dossier and into the other ones um, when they're expression of your pedagogical skills or your research expertise. Um, all right, there's, I'm going to talk about a couple of strategies moving forward, just about P promotion and tenure in general at this university and in general, and then we'll do workshopping your actual pieces. Well, first we'll take a break and then we'll do workshopping. So as I mentioned, promotion and tenure are two different things. Promotion means from associate to assi assistant to associate. Tenure means can't fire me now. Um, at this university, they can be together. You can apply for them at the same time, but they actually have different merits. So you have to talk about when you're talking about promotion merits versus when you're talking about tenure merits. They're not super different, but they are different. Tenure involves a little more international reputation than promotion, or promotion's a little bit more about your field. Um, you can split them and go up for them in different years. That's the only way to split them. You can't split them and go up in the same year. It's not a split. You have to name when you get there, whether you're going up for promotion and or tenure. If you don't say it, the committee won't know, and that's not good. Um, but yeah, we talked a little bit about the timelines where like if you split them and you, you have to go promotion and then tenure, you can't do tenure then promotion. Promotion has to come first. You, have to, you can only be tenured as an associate. Um, so if you do promotion to associate one year and tenure after the other, it becomes an easier case. Because if you fail the promotion, you can try it again the next year. Um, but if you pass, it becomes much harder to deny you tenure because you're you were promoted. So under what grounds can we promote you but deny you tenure? That would be weird. And again, you can tell because committees are struck usually in the last departmental meeting before the summer, you know who's going to be on the PT committee and deal with it that way. If you go up for early, you have to make a stronger case. But 
it's not like it's rocket science. Uh, I don't know too many people who go up. I think I've only heard of one case where someone went up early and just had to wait a year. Uh, and it's mostly because they didn't have a book deal in that department, they needed, needed a book. Um, there's a strategy. So when you go up for promotion and tenure, not third year review, but promotion and tenure, there are three le outside letter writers who review your promotion and tenure files and says from their university and their discipline whether you would get from whether you would get promoted and tenured according to them. Someone you have worked with cannot be that person. So if you are in a niche discipline, like I am. Uh, you may choose not to collaborate that with that person until after you are promoted or tenured. And I was just on a on a group. There's an indigenous person who does uh, digital data sovereignty. There are not a ton, a lot of people who are indigenous who do da digital data sovereignty in the world. And there was four of us who are about to write a piece together about digital data sovereignty. And this one person who was about to go up for tenure and promotion said, "Actually, I need to not co-author or write this piece." because I need all of you to be my letter writers. Okay, bye. And she left the piece because getting something on a chapter as a co-author was way less important to her promotion and tenure than having a uh, letter writer she could call on. So keep that in mind. Um, I saved one person in my field who I, we really wanted to collaborate, but we decided not to until after I got promotion and tenure because he made an awesome letter writer and I used him. So FYI. And then finally, ask for other people's files in your department. Um, ask for everyone's files if you can get them. Ask for other people's files. There's one file. There's one person in our department whose file, whose promotion and tenure files are so well organized. I recommend everyone use his. There's another person who's who's super interdisciplinary and makes a really great case. We have another really good teacher. Use hers, right? So there's so ask for multiple files to see how they craft things, and always, always, always have someone look at your dossier before you hand it in. Finally, one of the things you have to do is, as your first year review and also every other step, is let your department head know that you're submitting it, which seems dumb because you have to, but you still have to let them know in an email. This is in the collective agreement. What it means is you should read the collective agreement now, so you know what you have to do this summer. And also you should set up an, uh, an appointment to just talk with your chair. Again, my chair was the one who told me like, all the stuff you put in service, that's research. What are you doing? Um, and in some cases, meet with the union if you think there's going to be problems. Um, yeah. That is all I can think of for the moment. Any questions?